reconvene and welcome our distinguished uh, second panel. Uh, as with the first panel, of course, uh, uh, it is committee policy. Is this Mr. Randolph? Yes, yes. it is. Oh, great, great. Um, to swear in all of our witnesses. So before you sit, Ms. Randolph, uh, let me stand and, raise, stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, of course, and the whole truth and nothing but the truth? If so, answer in the affirmative. Right, you may be seated. Let the record reflect that all the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Uh, Mr. Frank Rusco is the director of the Government Accountability Office of the National Resources and Environment Team. Mr. Rusco has been at GAO for 11 years and his work there focuses on energy issues, including oil and gas royalty collection and policy. We want to welcome you to the uh, committee. <coughs> then Ms. Mary Kendall has been at the Department of the Interior Office of the Inspector General since 1999. When she first served as Deputy Inspector General, Ms. Kendall became Acting Director in 2009. Before joining the Inspector General's office, Ms. Kendall served as an attorney at the Environmental Protection Agency for over a decade. We welcome you to the committee. Um, Ms. Danielle Bryan uh, has been the Executive Director of the Project on Government Oversight uh, since 1993. Ms. Bryan has led numerous investigations that have exposed wasteful government spending and helpful and uh, spending and helped bring policy reform to government programs. We also welcome you to the committee. Uh, Ms. Randolph is the parish president and of course uh, for uh, pronounced Lafouche. Yeah, thank you very much. I worked on that all night. <laughs> Uh, as well as serving as parish president, Ms. Randolph is the owner of a public relations and advertising uh, company and was previously an editor at the uh, Latouche uh, Le Gazette. We welcome you. At this time, I ask that each witness deliver uh, their five-minute uh, testimony, which will allow us an opportunity to raise questions with you. And let me just sort of go through the procedure. You start out, the light is on green, then it goes to yellow, which means you have a minute to sum up, and then of course it's on red. And then at that time, the members will raise questions with you. So I would like to begin with you, Mr. Rusko, and for your five minutes and just come right down the line. And we're here again, we welcome you to the committee. Mr. Rusko, you may begin. Thank you, uh, Chairman Towns, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today about Interior's reorganization of the Minerals Management Service. This reorganization takes place in the context of the disastrous deep water oil spill, and it is hoped that some of the proposed changes to Interior's management of oil and gas will reduce the risks of future spills. It is also important, however, to recognize that Interior faces multiple challenges in effectively and efficiently managing its federal oil and gas program. Over the past five years, GAO and others have evaluated many aspects of Interior's management of oil and gas production on federal lands and waters and have found many def deficiencies. As a result, we have recommended numerous changes to the program. In fairness, Interior has responded to many of these recommendations with actions that we hope will result in improved efficiency and effectiveness. 
Many specific challenges remain, however, and we hope that Interior will keep its focus on addressing the deficiencies we have found, even as it undergoes organizational change. The findings and recommendations from GAO's recent evaluations are detailed in my written statement for the record. In the remainder of my oral comments, I want to discuss three key examples that illustrate a fundamental challenge for Interior. While each of the examples come from separate evaluations and will require separate actions to resolve, I hope that my discussion will make it clear that all three share an important common thread. Specifically, each of these problems illustrates the importance to Interior of keeping up with and, ad and adapting to change. First, until recently, Interior had gone over 25 years without fundamentally reevaluating its approach to leasing oil and gas properties. When we evaluated Interior's lease management practices, we found that Interior did less than other resource owners to encourage diligent development. Specifically, other resource owners did more than Interior to require or incentivize rapid development of promising oil and gas leases while offering more time for development of less promising or more speculative leases. Second, until recently, Interior had gone for over 20 years without fundamentally reevaluating its approach to collecting revenue for oil and gas production. When we evaluated Interior's approach in the context of what other resource owners do, we found that the federal government collected among the lowest levels of revenue from over 100 systems evaluated. Further, we found that because Interior's revenue collection system was inflexible to changes in oil and gas prices, that Interior was at an increased risk of succumbing to ad hoc changes to royalties in response to price changes. For example, in the mid-1990s, low oil and gas prices and pressure from oil companies led to royalty relief for deep water leases. With the subsequent increase in oil and gas prices, this royalty relief will cost the federal government billions of dollars of lost revenue over the lifetime of the affected leases. Finally, in recent evaluations, we found that Interior's oil and gas program utilizes data systems that are mutually incompatible, lack key functionality, and lag far behind similar systems used by industry. This poses risk to the effective and efficient management of the oil and gas program and the collection of revenues. Part of the cause of these problems is that the IT systems were developed in a piecemeal fashion over a long period of time with little to no centralized oversight or planning. We are encouraged that Interior has begun recently to reevaluate its leasing policies, its revenue collection, and that Interior recognizes it faces significant IT challenges. However, the potential for future management problems will remain until and unless Interior adopts an effective risk-based approach that periodically evaluates and adapts to changes in the oil and gas industry, the practices of other resource owners, the IT environment, as well as other significant facets of oil and gas management. There is risk inherent in all activities and completely eliminating the risk associated with oil and gas development is not possible. However, if Interior builds risk management into its internal structure and applies it consistently to important management decisions over time, it can do much better at identifying risk and mitigating that risk to the extent possible. This is true regardless of how Interior is ultimately restructured, and Interior will not be fully successful until it addresses this fundamental challenge. This concludes my oral statement. I will be happy to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you very much uh, for your statement. Um, Ms. Kendall. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to testify today about the proposed reorganization of the Minerals Management Service. As you well know, we have identified in MMS programmatic weaknesses and some egregious misconduct. In the report released in May of this year, we found more of the same. Although the misconduct is considerably less salacious than that in our report issued in 2008 about misconduct in the Royalty and Kind program, both highlight a challenge that the successor agencies to MMS face. That is, the potential conflicts of a regulatory body that is inherently tied to the industry it regulates. I am concerned about the environment in which these federal employees operate and the ease with which they move between industry and government. 
I am also concerned about the conduct of industry representatives, that they should think it permissible to fraternize and provide federal government employees with gifts after all the media coverage about this practice is somewhat hard to fathom, but may be informed by the environment as well. While not included in our May 2010 report, we discovered that the individuals involved in the fraternizing and gift exchange, both government and industry, have often known one another since childhood. Their relationships were formed well before they joined industry or government. MMS has relied upon the ability to hire employees with industry, and ex industry experience. With the announcement that MMS will be reorganized, the department is poised to reconsider some of our recommendations for programmatic improvement. These must, however, be bolstered with an emphasis on ethics to include controls and strong oversight. Let me focus on the last element of strong oversight. In the fall of 2008, Inspector General Earl Devaney testified before the House Committee on Natural Resources, which is a correction to my written testimony. Describing what was then a fledgling office within the Office of Inspector General, now called our Royalty Initiatives Group. Since that time, we have also established an investigative unit dedicated to energy issues and have expanded our oversight coverage beyond MMS to the energy and minerals programs at the Bureau of Land Management. Until recently, these two offices have been dedicated to royalties related oversight and improvements. Since the events of April 20th, however, it has become increasingly clear that we must expand their scope to provide oversight of the operational, environmental, safety, inspection, and enforcement aspects of energy production on federal lands and in the Outer Continental Shelf. We are also hopeful that the newly created Investigation and Review Unit will provide an additional element of oversight to the successor MMS agencies. The OIG is to a significant degree reactive in our investigative efforts. We hope that the IRU will provide continuous compliance review of the program offices to identify potential weaknesses before they become serious problems. We also rely on the bureaus to conduct internal investigations and reviews of allegations which simply do not rise to the level of OIG attention. The IRU will be a dedicated point of contact to which we can refer such matters. Presently, the Office of Inspector General is well into a multi-pronged effort to address multiple areas of concern relative to offshore drilling. We have dedicated most of our central region staff to this undertaking. We are also participating in the investigations being led by the Department of Justice into the events that led to the disaster on the Deepwater Horizon and the catastrophic events following. In addition to these efforts, we will continue building our oversight capacity beyond royalties into the areas of safety and oversight of drilling operations, both on and offshore. The ongoing OIG efforts regarding OCS safety and environmental concerns are also addressing a two-pronged request from Secretary Salazar. First, to the Outer Continental Shelf Safety Oversight Board, a body created by secretarial order on April 30th of this year. The Secretary requested that the Board make recommendations to improve and strengthen the Department's overall management, regulation, and oversight of OCS operations. Second, the Secretary asked the OIG to address specific deficiencies in MMS policies or practices that need to be addressed to ensure that operations in the OCS are conducted safely, protective of human life, health, and the environment. Since these two requests were so similar in scope, the OIG effort will respond twofold to these requests by the Secretary. While we will provide the Safety Oversight Board our findings and recommendations by mid-August, we have already found several areas that call for further review, and we will continue to pursue these to conclusion. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my prepared testimony today, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, and I appreciate your testimony, uh, Ms. Bryan. Thank you, Chairman, for inviting me to testify. I also want to thank Ranking Member Issa and Representative Maloney for their unrelenting oversight of this troubled agency. We've been working with Representative Maloney for about 15 years on this issue. MMS was created in 1982 because royalty collections had been buried inside the USGS, yet the oversight functions again were buried in MMS beneath their other mission of promoting oil and gas production. If there is any silver, small silver lining to the Gulf disaster, it, it is that it has called attention to long-needed reforms. 
And while the reorganization is a good step, we have real concerns about its implementation and whether those who are planning uh, it are really consulting the appropriate stakeholders. We also have to fix the frequency with which officials have gone through the revolving doors. It's been discussed many times this morning, but I really think the egregious example of the two recent MMS directors going to become presidents of an offshore drillers association needs a little bit further discussion because the MMS director was joining a trade association whose explicit mission was to secure, quote, a favorable regulatory environment for offshore oil and gas drillers. Yet they were the very regulators when they had been working in the public sector. So you have to ask whose interests were they actually serving when they were the regulator. There have been several major improvements to ethics at Interior and further steps to slow the revolving door are in legislation passed by both the Senate Energy and House Natural Resources Committees. We do hope the House's stronger provision is soon passed into law. The second problem is that MMS has always been dependent on industry for technical knowledge and allowed industry to operate largely on what the GAO described as an honor system. Representative Maloney's legislation will significantly help MMS gain back some of its upper hand. When it comes to inspectors, it's hard for Interior to attract and keep the talent it needs when inspectors are starting as a GS7. And this is a very important point. There's so much emphasis on the revolving door, which is very important for us to be focusing on. But if we only look at that and not on how we're compensating those who are working as inspectors, I think it's a huge problem. Pogo's learned of one inspector, for example, who after three years on the job has still had no training. So we need to be investing in these inspectors. The last inspection conducted on the Deepwater Horizon was performed by an inspector who is still in training. The government must establish federal training academies, like those for mine safety and the FBI, to ensure that inspectors, both on and offshore, are receiving regular training not paid for or run by industry. So changing the culture requires more than reorganization, and it requires more than new leadership. They will need to dig deep into the management of the agency. And no matter what reforms are put in place, they can only be effective with increased transparency about MMS's operations. Despite the administration's open government directive, which has focused on each agency providing new information to the public, Interior, for example, has only focused on disclosures of things like the nation's national treasures, which were already online anyway, rather than information about oil and gas leases. The kind of information we all need to know coming from Interior, the kinds of things that policymakers would learn if we actually started investigating and talking to them, some of the people on, online. For example, even after the Deepwater Horizon explosion, inspector concerns are still being ignored. For example, an MMS inspector discovered that a Deepwater production facility was operating days after he had issued a cease and desist order because he believed it was in dangerous noncompliance. When he contacted his supervisor for approval to issue another order, his supervisor overruled him. And this is in the wake of the Gulf crisis. We've learned that this incident is not unique, but has become a common practice where inspectors feel they need to ask permission from their supervisors because they're more likely to get in trouble for issuing an incident of noncompliance than for not issuing one. There, this is where the real work will have to happen, changing that culture. MMS inspectors are just beginning to speak out, despite the fact that they have no real whistleblower protections. And I can tell you with experience that MMS has been a hostile place for whistleblowers. If there's another takeaway from the disaster, it's that whistleblower protections for federal employees are urgently needed and would be offered through the legislation sponsored by Representatives Van Hollen and Pat Platts, the Whistleblower Protection Enhancement Act. Ultimately, MMS must reorganize its priorities to serve taxpayers and protect their resources and not industry. As an important first step, Congress must enact H.R. 3534 and S. 3516. Thank you again for your oversight of MMS, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, Ms. Randolph. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On May 8th, oil first appeared on the shores of our parish from the Deepwater Horizon blowout, an event caused by reckless tragic, disastrous decisions made by BP personnel who obviously did not follow established safety guidelines. We have now endured 74 days of relentless effort to protect our wet wetlands and our wildlife. Birds don't fly, fish don't swim, and fishermen can't make a living. Then came the moratorium on deep water drilling, literally 
adding insult to injury. Research conducted by the LSU Center for Energy Studies has revealed that this moratorium, suspension, pause, ban, whatever the term du jour is, will not only impact a few parishes in Louisiana, 43 in Florida, 42 in Texas, Louisiana 32, and Mississippi 7. In the Department of the Interior's own report, DOI estimated about 120,000 jobs would be lost. Nine of the top ten taxpayers in Lafouche Parish are located at Port Fouchon, which services all 33 rigs singled out in the initial moratorium. The spill has decimated the fishing industry. The moratorium will essentially end life as we know it in our parish. No business can survive a six-month pause and this much uncertainty. Up to 40% of our property tax base could be lost by 2012 as a result of the drilling ban. Rig owners have stated in testimony to the President's Commission on the Oil Spill that they intend to leave the Gulf for other opportunities elsewhere in the world. Some service company employees have been offered transfers to locations in other states. Fam families are now making decisions as to whether the husband and father or the wife and mother will live elsewhere, with the rest of the family staying behind to finish schooling. These are the lucky ones. The rest will be terminated. In Lafouche, that could be 10,000 people. The span is sending a mixed message. In April 2010, the unemployment rate in our parish was 4.4 percent, the lowest in the nation. By November 30th, the stated end of the moratorium, the number of unemployed will increase dramatically. In this country, a whole lot of money has been borrowed to create jobs to stimulate the economy. People in Lafouche Parish and those associated with the oil and gas industry and its support services are, are not expendable Americans. We fuel this country. On May 28th, I had the opportunity to personally ask President Obama to reconsider his decision based on the de devastating economic blow we would suffer. He declined, but he did offer to send down an economic team to assess the moratorium's impact on our parish. Again, that was May 28th. The team will arrive July 26th. President Obama, in early May, we have announced that no permits for drilling new wells will go forward until the 30-day safety and environmental review I requested is complete. That was the first intense scrutiny of the industry. Some of these commissioners disagreed with the moratorium decision, yet it was established anyway. The President formed another commission with its members asked to restudy this for at least six months. We will die a slow death. Statistics indicate that an oil tanker has four times greater chance of spilling its cargo than an oil well has of blowing out. Tankers from around the world carrying up to three million barrels of oil traverse the Gulf all the way to the port of Houston daily. 11,000 tankers traversed the Gulf last year. The moratorium's own language emphasizes the shortage of resources available to respond to another spill in the Gulf as a reason for pause. In order to resume activities, operators must submit evidence that they have the ability to respond effectively to a potential spill. There are those who call for an immediate halt to oil and gas. What is being overlooked in the rationale behind the suspension is that all of these tankers traverse the Gulf. Based upon the rationale behind the new moratorium on deepwater drilling issued July 13th by the Secretary of the Interior, I am today challenging the President, Secretary Salazar, and the federal government to protect all Gulf states from another spill as completely as possible. Stop all, all tanker traffic in the Gulf of Mexico. Mr. Chairman, I, I await your questions. Thank you very much, and uh, I really appreciate um, you know, your um, testimony. And uh, let me begin by um, with you, Ms. Bryan. You said something that I want to make certain I understand. That you said dig deep into the management. What do you mean by that? I'm concerned that what we're dealing with now is really sort of the top layer. And what we've learned over the many years of looking at MMS is that a bulk of the problem is still there just because you change the people at the top. And we see that there are, we've known for years about the auditors who had been uh, stifled by their supervisors and now we're learning about inspectors with the same kinds of problems where the mid-management is still in line and, and nothing's really changed from that perspective. So changing the name didn't get us there? Breaking it apart and changing the name is just not enough. Okay. Ms. Randolph, before I um, uh, 
move any further. I want to know in terms of how big is a parish? How many people? We have 95,000 people, sir. How many? We have 95,000 people, sir. Is that an elected position? Mine, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay. That sounds like mine. <laughs> <laughs> you have to run for it. Yeah. Yes. Um, Mr. Rusko and, Ms., and, and, and I guess and Ms. Bryan, I want to ask, and, and probably and you too, Ms. Kendall, uh, do you think that the proposed reorganization plan can successfully reform MMS? I'm, I'm sorry, the current, the current proposed plan? Yes. Um, can well, it reform it and, yeah. and, 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 do I, where we, and, and get us where we need to go? Uh, I, I saw I heard Ms. Bryan on it, but you know. Yeah, our, our position on that is that, that there have been in the last five years dozens, over a hundred recommendations to address specific deficiencies that, that have been identified. And um, we've looked deeply at, at, the, at the process and found deficiencies everywhere we look. So all of those must be addressed for, for um, Interior to effectively manage oil and gas program. But uh, that's true no matter what the organization is. Changing the organization will not implement automatically those uh, those needed reforms, and so it, it, they're, they're going to have to do both. If if they want to reform, they're if they're going to, want to reorganize, they're also going to have to implement all of the reforms. Ms. Kendall, you want to add? I share the sentiment of both Mr. Rusco and Ms. Bryan that reorganization in and of itself is not an answer to resolving profound management um, challenges. Um, the, it's, it will be in the implementation and the other um, reforms that the department makes relative to the management of oil and gas, leasing, oversight, and royalty collection. If, yes, if, I, if I could add a little more meat to my overall comment on that, uh, while we certainly agree that, that splitting up that conflict in mission is an essential change, mm -hmm. it also could create more problems because what we now have are three smaller agencies inside a bureaucracy. And as we know, as we're all sort of students of government, it's all about how big you are in the government and how powerful you are. So now you have smaller entities, and we're particularly worried from the audit perspective. We have been thinking for some time that uh, there may be some efficiencies created by looking at those small audit shops across the federal government and thinking about housing them in one place where you'd actually create an efficiency and have, uh, have them actually be a, an entity where there is more value added, uh, uh, value placed on their role as auditors, for example. The other thing that worries us is um, that, that some of the people who really need to be at the table as we're talking about this uh, reorganization aren't there. The states and tribes that MMS is responsible for collecting royalties from are not adequately being uh, consulted and uh, participating in the process, and that's a great concern to us as well. You know, does the Department of Interior have the expertise uh, to be able to do the kind of monitoring and, uh, and oversight that we really uh, expecting? Well, because they, I'm looking at GS7, that's uh, what thirty-eight thousand dollars a year. Isn't that awful? Yeah, to yeah, think I of mean, the uh, responsibility that we're placed on them, and we're so undervaluing them by how much we're paying them. The other part of what we think is important that hasn't been on the table at all yet is BLM at Interior also is conducting these inspections, and we're not talking about them. So shouldn't there be some conversation about at least merging those missions in, in one? Uh, entity as well. So I think there's a lot of important things that should be part of the conversation that haven't been yet. Right. Do you think they have the expertise? Um, <clears throat> no, we have we've found many uh, cases in which the level of, of expertise, the level of training, and uh, just the sheer number of people to do the job are inadequate for, especially for in the in the inspection uh, area, and in the area of petroleum engineers to to evaluate drilling plans and to to evaluate uh, the processes. Right. I guess my five minutes is up. I don't think you started the clock. So. Uh Mr. Chairman, I'd ask unanimous consent. You have all the time of the other members here <laughs> on your side. I'd be delighted to take it, but I'll yield five minutes to you before we do that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, like the Chairman, I, I think you know there's no limit to the amount of, of 
questions we'd like to ask each of you. I'll start with uh, Mrs. Randolph. <coughs> I asked Secretary Salazar a moment ago, uh, at the, or an hour ago now, about why an arbitrary six months rather than when the existing well, which is certainly a danger until it's killed, once it's killed, why he couldn't reconsider uh, at that moment changing. And he gave me an answer that over the next six weeks, eight weeks, he was going to have all these studies come back. You've seen the President make a personal promise to you. You have sat there watching people be laid off in an industry that is not being compensated at all for being laid off. They're not like the fishermen. The, uh, the oil men themselves are just on their own if they get laid off. They cannot go to Mr. F uh, Feinberg to ask for any money because they're not part of the, quote, affected directly. What do you need to see from this administration in order to have the confidence that they care enough about Louisiana to actually put people back to work? Well, the immediate response would be to lift the moratorium. Um, and, but do you agree with the premise that if Secretary Salazar were to reconsider a date shorter, that when, this, when uh, the well is actually killed, which hopefully will be in a matter of weeks, that that might be the appropriate time to say, okay, it no longer is a danger, therefore resources could be available, therefore we could lift the ban. Would you be satisfied if he used that instead of uh, six months and then we'll relook at it with no expectation that that would be a hard, hard reopening? We would be very satisfied with that. That would be a finite date. Uh, the industry itself could make decisions based upon that date, and therefore we would not lose all the service company jobs that are associated with it. Yes, some, but but my concern this morning is this: Mr. Ballmer talked about another study that begins or. or additional hearings that begin on August 4th and end on September 15th with a report due on October 31st. So it, it's an, another study that, that doesn't provide us any direction. Well, and unfortunately, uh, that'll be two days before or three days before the uh, midterm elections. I suspect no one's going to look at them until after that day, too. Uh, Ms. Bryan, you and I have worked together on transparency and will yes, continue to. Uh, Mrs. Randolph particularly uh, has experience about ghost assets, all the parishes do, where <clears throat> there are claims in writing that X amount of skimmers, X amount of, of various assets are brought to bear, and then we find out they actually weren't there, and we, to be honest, do not know if the total number of skimmers that each were claimed is greater than the total number of skimmers ever contracted. Do you have any better transparency at all? Have you been able to get any better uh, information on what the real assets that brought to bear were, and, and if not, why do you think you're not seeing it? I, we have not had any better access to information. We do think that there's a tremendous problem with the lack of transparency <coughs> in this entire cleanup operation. I think part of the problem is there has been a, uh, an acceptance <coughs> that BP was in charge for a long time and sort of leaving it to the private sector, which we really believe this is something where the government should be in charge and making all information uh, public to the general public, and that just hasn't been the case. Well, you know, one of the interesting things that I discovered with the chairman when we went down there is that they run consensus management, uh, which is a nice way of saying one group's in charge, except really they're not in charge. It takes everyone to have a decision. <clears throat> Therefore, nobody's really accountable. <laughs> Therefore, the decision to release is probably beyond the expertise of everybody. Uh, it's no way to run a railroad. Uh, I guess I'm going to sort of pose to both of you for a second. Uh, and, and, I, and I think, Mr. Rusko, because of your, your past studies, I think you see it, but you've both been asked, this reorganization, if you will, moving the deck chairs on the Titanic, doesn't it inherently delay the ability of the organization, while they're busy reorganizing, from getting to the various failures that both of you have seen in past uh, inspections and studies? And that is a concern that we have. We're, we're, we know that organizational change is, is very difficult, it's disruptive, and, and it, it, it takes a lot of uh, agency resources. And uh, at the same time, they're dealing with a, this catastrophic oil spill. They're also dealing with trying to uh, do the work that, that they feel they need to before they can lift the moratorium. And, they, and then they have this backlog of, of uh, recommendations that they're trying to address to improve their systems. It, it is, um, it is a concern. 
Uh, Ms. Kendall, uh, same for you. I assume that it's very hard for, for your various IGs and so on to <clears throat> the people that work for you to actually figure out who you're supposed to look at and what you're supposed to oversee if the chairs are moving around. Uh, I'm assuming that one of the problems right now is you really don't know which one of these three entities to focus on. Is that correct? Just we're, during the reorganization. During the reorganization? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, what we're, what we're really trying to do is focus on issue areas, um, but following those issue areas as they're being moved around has not yet become a challenge because the actual movement hasn't taken place, but I imagine it would be in the future. One, one quick last question, if I could, Chairman. Uh, you know, the, the Chairman and I enjoy the title of Oversight and Reform. <clears throat> and the theory of that is that Congress has an absolute right uh, to, if you will, intervene in the organization of government. Congress actually authorizes who gets to be a cabinet or not. We created the, uh, the cabinet position for Homeland Security and so on. If, if the GAO were tasked in combination with this committee to look at the various revenue entities not just in the Department of Interior, but primarily in Department of Interior, uh, the various, well, maybe include the IRS, so it would clearly be outside, the various parts of inspection that go on throughout the government, but particularly Department of Interior, uh, <clears throat> and of course contracting, and ask the bigger question of, should this entity really be truly consolidated with other areas of, if you will, cultural uh, excellence by comparison. Do you believe that's something you could deliver at least a preliminary report back to us during this Congress? In other words, are the basic facts of these other entities, their existence uh, for consideration by this committee something that we could begin working on before uh, the lights go out uh, at the end of uh, December? Uh, I think it's something we we would be willing to talk to your staff about. I, I hate to commit at this point to okay. anything without further more information. Well, Mr. Chairman, there's a, there's more than enough if there's a second round, but but that would be something that I'd like to have our staffs explore is is whether we could take an active role in looking at a much larger reorganization, uh, particularly uh, at, when it comes to the the following, which is I heard the GS7 and I appreciate that, but I happen to know that the inspectors go up to about $100,000, they're GS 13, 14. So there, there are some people that are paid relatively well and in fact paid better than their counterparts in the Corps of Engineers who oversee you know, public construction, including NASA. So with that, I'd yield back, Mr. Chairman. Right, and I'd also like to add, maybe we need to look at terms of um, the stability in terms of you know, how long people actually stay with the agency. I think that's uh, another issue that Absolutely. we need to um, uh, consider a, as well. At this time, I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, all of you were here for the first panel. You listened in on the questioning. Uh, I was intrigued by Mr. and I wanted to ask Secretary Salazar some questions, but just because of votes, wasn't able to get back in time before he was dismissed. But I was intrigued by uh, Congressman Turner's timeline prior to the terrible accident uh, in the Gulf, the Deepwater Horizon. Um, so I want, I want your thoughts. Do, do you, I mean, obviously BP is at fault here and we understand that, but um, do you believe, well, let me go back to this. <clears throat> In Mr. Turner's timeline, he referenced four different occasions where standard inspections were not performed. So I, I want your thoughts. Do you believe that this accident could have been prevented if MMS would have done those inspections? And we'll just go down the, go down the line. It's difficult to say, but I, but I think that, that there's a bit of a misconception about what these inspections are about. Uh, most of the inspections <clears throat> that take place on rigs offshore are dealing with uh, safety of equipment, such as railings, stairways, slippery surfaces. They're dealing with environmental issues, such as any, any noticeable leaks of, of uh, hydrocarbons, and they're dealing with production verification issues, looking to make sure that the, that the um, 
uh, the metering is done correctly and that there are no bypasses of meters and, and that everything is accounted for. So you're for. saying that those inspections, people aren't actually out on the, out on the facility in, in, the, in the, the equipment itself? Or? The, they're, they're out there and they also do look at records. They, they, look, at, okay. they look at records of, uh, to, to ensure that the approved plans are being followed and they have, you know. Well, but certainly it, the fact that if those inspections would have been done, there would have been a better chance to detect those problems. I, I, I can't argue with that. Yeah. Ms. Kendall? Um, I, I would echo everything Mr. Risco said, but I would also add that I, based on what I know, which, and I am, by f <laughs> I am far from um, a, a petroleum engineer, but I believe that what is coming sort of to the fore is that things like the well design and review and approval of that, um, the actual practices of of when to pull the mud and replace it, um, were the kinds of things that, and there are any number of, of sort of decision points along the way that may have prevented um, what we're dealing with now. But I don't know that inspectors are the answer to that um, sort of issue, that there has to be some much more careful review of those kinds of not, issues. Not disagreeing. I mean, and we're talking about restructuring, reorganization. That all is, is probably necessary. But the law said do these inspections, and they were not done, and a bad thing happened, could have been maybe prevented if, in fact, those inspections had been done. That's, I mean, it seems pretty logical to conclude maybe we would have caught some if they had done what they were. They didn't even do their job. I think maybe is certainly reasonable. And, and, and if you cut to the chase, they didn't do their job. And because now we have this terrible incident where lives were lost, where economies are affected, Ms. Randolph said that firsthand, uh, people's lives, families' lives, small screwed up and didn't do what they were supposed to do. Now we have this terrible ask, we're going to stop drilling everywhere and further and, and make a bad situation even worse. That's where we're at. And maybe it could have been prevented if, in fact, they would have done what they were supposed to do. Ms. Bryant. I, I also don't really know enough about those inspections. I think in general there's no question that MMS has been not doing its job for many, 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 many years. And so I think there's no doubt that if MMS was held accountable, these are issues that have been raised by the Congress, by the GAO, by the IG, by POGO for, you know, 15 years. And so there's no question that if, if MMS had reformed in the many times it was told it needed to, then we wouldn't have seen what we had at, uh, in this accident. Thank you. Ms. Randall. I think it's a shared responsibility. Not only did MMS not do its job, um, BP didn't do its due diligence. Right. Are you back? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Right. Thank you, gentlemen, for yielding. Uh, now I yield to the gentleman from California, Congressman Bill Bray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I deal to yield to Congressman Welch. Yeah. Right. Whatever the okay. chair. I'm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Now I yield to you. Thank you. Mr. Rusko, I would like to talk about the response to the crisis. Um, the, um, does anybody have any information at all? Did the Army Corps use the spillways uh, upstream from New Orleans to divert water into the Pontchartrain to try to get that flow to keep the oil out of the Pontchartrain and, and Lake Bourne? I'm sorry, that's something we have not studied. Okay. Uh, Madam President, I was a county uh, chairman myself, and so I kind of relate to the frustration that when you want to do things, um, those who are always saying, you know, uh, saying no, or continue to say no, even though things need to be done. Uh, does it, do you have a clip of what happened? Uh, staff have a clip of that piece about the berm in uh, Grand Isle. Can we play that? And we submitted the staff of the Corps, and we asked the Corps to help us. And in the meantime, we got these different agencies that popped up like a cork, and, and these little groups, and it was anti. And it was 95 pages of questions that our engineers, and we worked through the weekends, many hours, took turns behind the computers and making email back and forth, making sure that we did everything right to question and answer. So, the bottom line, and I'm gonna be honest with y'all, I was devastated when I didn't get that permit. Because I believed in my commander in chief, Madam President, I married a girl from your part of the world. Um, 
And the fact of the frustration of the people down there when they want to do something, um, being told, no, no, we have to study it. Did you have any of the, the Grand Isle is over where Jean Lafitte used to hang out? It's not your part of the world, but um, um, did you have any kind of situations like that where you basically ran into this issue where everybody said, stop, we've got to study something, don't do things, and basically we're always telling the locals no, or did we get a, a lot of support of saying, go ahead and we'll work it out later? It was very similar to what David was describing in this video. It is, it is, they are our neighbor. So this is, these berms are very important to us. And now I'm watching a storm that may be coming into the Gulf. <clears throat> our response in those situations is from the bottom up. We do what we know best. We respond naturally, instinctively, as, as humans should, with, with plans in place. Um, this has been a very unique situation and a very frustrating one, yes. I, I mean, I really relate it to the, the, the fact that the um, Army Corps would always love to say, we need to study the environmental impact of building a sand berm. Um, and not realizing that there are times that you've got to call an audible. You've, there's times, the leadership means dropping the rule book and doing what you can, where you can, in the best common sense way, and this one was really kind of an interesting one of, well, we've got to make sure that a berm doesn't hurt the environment while the oil is coming in over the top of it. And it's almost as if inaction is justifiable and less of a, of a concern to bureaucracy than the possibility of possibly doing something wrong. And I guess that's the part that I really um, think that we got to talk about. We've got to not only empower people to make those calls. My, I've got to, you know, I've spent a lot of, lot of t uh, quality time over in Cocotry on Bayou Terrebonne and um, at the camp there. And so the, the family loves that area. But to sit there and have somebody that basically the system uh, rewards those for inaction and it's safer for a bureaucrat to say no than to say yes, we accept that most of the time. But during a crisis, there should be a way of burning a fire that says, look, if you don't call an audible, if you don't do extraordinary things, if you don't throw the playbook away and do, use innovation, you're going to get in tr more trouble than if you do something wrong. And I think we've got to figure out how to do that. And uh, Ms. Bryan, you got any comments or any concerns about that? I've been waiting to call, to, uh, call on you anyways just for your name. Okay? I know. You love my name. <laughs> Uh, well, what you're describing is very similar to what we saw happening with these inspectors, where their supervisors are making them scared to actually uh, as assess uh, non-compliance orders because they're afraid if they do something, they're more likely to get in trouble than if they don't do something. And that's even after this incident. So it's a really scary mindset to me. Mr. Chairman, I, I will just tell you, I personally witnessed the results of Hurricane Katrina. I was in Louisiana and I was in Mississippi, and I saw the difference between the mindsets. While everybody, the feeling that seemed to be in New Orleans of don't do anything because you may do something or not have something done approved. And when I went over to Picayune, or just on the other side of the, the Pearl River, it was, look, do what you can do. We'll worry about, you know, whose jurisdiction it is later. I saw a real difference. And I just hope somewhere down the line in our federal responses, we can sort of adopt that, that Mississippi mentality that I saw during that disaster rather than where what I saw down south, and no offense, <laughs> Madam President, but there was a distinct difference. It was astonishing that two different political jurisdictions could respond so absolutely different um, to crisis, and I, I think there was a lot to learn there. So thank you very much for your testimony. Right. I thank the gentleman from California for his uh, statement. Before, just before I call on the con uh, Congressman Welch, uh, Mr. Luca Meyer, uh, I'd like to ask for unanimous consent that I include a statement in the record. Um, okay. Now I yield to um, the gentleman from uh, Mr. Welch. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I am concerned about <clears throat> a uh, lapse in the loyal, uh, royalty collection for the period of leases between 1996 and uh, 2000. And I just wanted to ask a few questions about that. Uh, Ms. Kendall. <clears throat> the Department of Interior, you've probably uh, become aware of this. There was a set of leases uh, that were issued between 1996 and 2000. They were under in a law that was passed by Congress that was intended to try to encourage domestic drilling, uh, but it was when oil was under $25 a barrel. And as I understand it, uh, the law said there would be no royalties until a trigger price of, I think, $26 a barrel was hit. 
Uh, oil now is, I don't know, $75 or $80 a barrel. At one point it was $140 a barrel. And uh, according to the report that uh, I've seen from the GAO, unless we change this so that we can collect the royalties on what would be due on these leases for the oil that is above the trigger price, uh, the taxpayers could be out about $60 billion. Uh, you familiar with that? Yes, sir, I am. And uh, are there any specific actions? And this, this uh, question of the loophole was litigated by Anacardo Petroleum. They argued that uh, the way the law was written, uh, there was not explicit authority to charge the regular royalty rate above the trigger price. Uh, many members of Congress who voted on that legislation had no idea that there was going to be an exemption no matter how high the price went. Uh, but the court decision was that the law uh, has to be changed in order for uh, the taxpayers to collect the royalties that was the intention of that act. Is that your understanding? Yes, sir. Uh, so it, would it be, is it your understanding that in order for there to be a collection on these royalties, we would have to pass a law to make that permissible? Congressman, I, I do, I'm familiar with the, the case that you're talking about, right. and I'm familiar with the, the act generally. I am not familiar specifically um, to, to any, any degree. I don't know if, if and this is, this is just my thinking off the top of my head, whether Congress could successfully go back and pass a law that addressed those years specifically retrospectively, um, I would just guess that it, there would be a challenge for that as well. Well, it, it, we, we'd have to get our legal advice and do it right, but is, it, I think all I'm asking you uh, to indicate is whether there appears to be any administrative remedy to what appears to be essentially a loophole by which the companies that are drilling on public lands uh, are doing so without paying royalties to the public for that uh, profit-making privilege. I, I'm, I'm going to have to rely on fairly um, limited memory, but I don't believe that there are administrative remedies when there was a fundamental flaw in the law <coughs> as found by the court. All right. Then I think, uh, Mr. Chairman, Congressman uh, Markey and I uh, will be introducing legislation that would be designed uh, to remedy that loophole uh, and provide to the public the royalties that they are due for drilling on the public lands. Uh, Ms. Bryan, are you aware of this? I am certainly aware of the problem, and I think it would be terrific if legislation were passed to correct it. You do? I do. All right. Uh, Ms. Randolph, I just want to welcome you. I think all of us are heartbroken. I went down to the Gulf, and as uh, heartbreaking as it was for me to fly out over that magnificent, uh, beautiful marshland and, at the Delta, uh, what was the hardest was coming back and meeting people who were fishermen in, in the oil industry and just seeing how lives down there have been turned upside down. So I just want to express to you uh, my heartfelt uh, 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 sadness about what the people of the Gulf Coast are enduring and will uh, long after Congress has moved on to other things. So thank you so much for coming and all you do down there. Thank you, sir. And as a recipient uh, parish of, of some of those royalty revenues, I uh, look forward to you increasing that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen, for yielding back. And um, let me just sort of, um, I guess, again, uh, uh, Mr. Rusko and, of course, Ms. Bryan and uh, uh, Ms. Kendall, how has this cozy relationship between the industry and MMS uh, impacted oversight and safety standards. Do you think it has interfered with it? I'd like to just second what Ms. Bryan said, that there, there's sort of two problems. There's, there's one that you could describe as a revolving door issue um, that may be a bigger problem at, at higher levels of management than it is at the level of inspectors and, and engineers. But there's a second problem, and that's that, that they don't pay, uh, for, by and large, don't pay a competitive wage with industry. So when the industry's in 
good shape, they can pay a lot more than what, what Interior is paying the, the people with, with comparable skills. And then when times are bad, Interior can hire people. So there's sort of a structural problem that could be dealt with uh, by addressing uh, the, the amount that they can pay uh, people and there are other, op other compensations as well. But I think that, that that's part of the problem. So it, 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 it does, though, the lack of the proper number and uh, amount of uh, expertise that they can bring to bear does affect their ability to, to do their job. <coughs> Kendall. I, I would also say that some of the exceptions in the ethics regulations um, have allowed folks to kind of get away from the, the intent of the regs. For instance, the um, acceptance of gifts because of a personal friendship. Um, these people are all friends. Uh, the folks in in industry and in MMS grew up together. They married each other's sisters or cousins. Um, they've been you know, playing on the same teams since they were in high school. And so the exception to the gift rule, which says if it's based on a personal friendship, um, could be exploited. On the other hand, if someone were to say I'm accepting this on the basis of a friendship, they should also be prohibited or recused from inspecting uh, the rigs or the facilities of the people who they have this friendship with. I, I think that there may be, and I go back to the, the ethics regs too, these are, these are the floor, not the ceiling of conduct. And I think MMS has an opportunity to make stricter rules apply to a very unique and a very specific problem that they have. And they could do it administratively. They don't have they don't need us. They could do it administratively. Right. Ms. Bryant. Um, Mr. Chairman, I have the benefit of of having looked across the federal government for many years and uh, and I have I continue to think MMS is probably the worst in the government when it comes to its coziness between the regulator and the regulated. And as I mentioned, uh, when you, uh, the Congress people were voting, Mr. Ice has certainly has known that. He's been working on this for years, and Mrs. Maloney has been working with her for 15 years on this issue. I mean, I, I think that there's no question that the coziness in this particular agency has been sort of extraordinary across the federal government. There's no comparison in our experience. Right. Even in the Congress, when you leave, you have to stay out a certain amount of time before you can come back and lobby the Congress. That's the Congress. So um, I'm wondering if maybe something along those lines shouldn't be instituted here. You oh, know, there, I, there's absolutely no question we need to change the rules when it comes to the revolving door. And there is strong legislation that's been uh, worked through the House Natural Resources Committee that would be addressing this particular issue. And I certainly hope the committee members support that legislation. I noticed you didn't start the clock, so that's good. Yeah, you know, but I, I now yield to uh, oh, Mr. Gao has Mr. gone. Mr. Gao, the gentleman from Indiana. <laughs> I mean, again, from, from New Louisiana, who's really familiar with this subject. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, my question is to um, my my question. I want, I want to focus on uh, the issue of uh, shallow water uh, permitting. Uh, I was reading one of the articles uh, from Louisiana today, and they were saying about the slow process of shallow water permitting. And this is a question uh, to um, President Randolph of Lafouche. Uh, how has this um, permitting process uh, affected the shallow drilling industry in your parish? The Department of the Interior and MMS's ability or, or charge to issue permits can create a de facto moratorium. Um, and, and MMS has done so. 
um, because the response to re the request for permits has been very, very, very slow in the shallow waters. Um, in, in the deep waters is what has been addressed in, in the media, but shallow waters, there's a de facto moratorium there as well. And uh, how has uh, how has this de facto moratorium affected uh, some of the uh, industry uh, in your parish? How has it affected uh, the people who are being employed by this industry? Some of the businesses that are directly or indirectly related to this industry. A shallow water, water de facto moratorium um, essentially has put independent contractors out of business. The fact that they cannot get permitted or re-permitted under the new guidelines um, affects a, a lot more of the small business owners in the community. We talk about the, the four, five major companies in this country, they are all companies. But when we talk about the shallow water, that's where the independents are, and the majority of the, the exploring companies are independents. They don't have the resources and, and or the uh, resources to sustain any type of long-term moratorium. They cannot survive that long, and therefore they've begun to lay off people, yes. Well, do you know of uh, any rigs or any low drilling companies, they either have moved to rigs or have shut down because of this low, slow permitting process? In the shallow waters? Yes. Yes, sir. Do you know the names of them? No, I don't have the names for you, but I can... But, but based on your knowledge that there, there have been rigs that have moved, uh, moved out of, of, of Louisiana or companies that have uh, shut down because of this moratorium, or at least de facto moratorium? Yes, sir. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Kendall, um, how has the um, are there ways uh, under the new rules and regulations implemented by MMS that would allow uh, greater speed of permitting to some of these shallow water rigs? I'm sorry, I I couldn't hear much of your question. Uh, are there ways or procedures to uh, to expedite the um, some of the mer permitting process through the MMS within the new rules and regulations that were implemented after Deepwater Horizon? I, I simply don't know the answer to that question. Um, I'm I'm not familiar with the the newly implemented regulations. Um, I can just speak to um, sort of in general terms. I know that. Um, in having discussions with people, the I think part of the, the contributing factor is MMS now has become a little gun shy and is, is being extraordinarily cautious in their review and their processing, not that that excuses them. And I know that it, it, it puts a toll on, on the folks who are reliant on those permits, but I'm not, I just don't know if there's anything in the new regs that, that would speed that up. Uh, thank you. Now you're back. Gentlemen's time has expired. I now yield to the gentlewoman from New York who has done a lot of work in this area, uh, Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney. I, I, I want to thank the chairman for uh, focusing on this important area of, of government and an area that uh, clearly needs reform. And I, I believe an area that uh, would not have uh, had this focus uh, if we hadn't had the catastrophe at catastrophe in the in the Gulf with BP and it's a uh, long overdue I, I uh, wanted to mention that earlier today in our hearing with uh, Commissioner Salazar we were talking about a recent GAO report that was really developed for this committee on the revenue share the government collects from the oil and gas produced in the Gulf and this report ranked our country 93rd uh, one of the lowest of the 104 revenue collection regimes around the world. I, I find this uh, absolutely scandalous. He also testified that the revenue royalty collection system had not been changed 
since 1920. Uh, I would like uh, to ask Ms. Bryan to respond to this. I, I know that uh, we worked together to end the Royalty and Kind program and have been uh, trying to have one set of books, not two or three, and, and to uh, really get a fair deal for the taxpayer. And could you comment on this and why do you think we rank, with our technology, our expertise, why do we rank 93rd? We should be first. I, I absolutely share your outrage, Mrs. Maloney. It's it's ridiculous, and there's absolutely no, certainly no excuse for it. I think I, I think this has, for reasons I've never been able to understand. You know, as we've said, we've been working on this for so many years. This is not news to us. This is an agency that has been sort of left to fester by itself without really breaking it open and, and fixing it. And I'm hoping that, as I mentioned before, if there's a small silver lining in the catastrophe, it's that it, the long needing reforms will finally happen. And uh, oh, how, how, how will this change take place and how long will it take before the royalties increase and we have more of an accurate uh, reflection of the value that is extracted from, from publicly owned lands? Well, at the moment, there's nothing pending that will actually change the collection of royalties at all. N none of the reforms that we are hearing about today will actually fix that. That is something that is still up to the Congress to tackle. Well, also in the GAO report that we've had, it found that the MMS uh, area should do more to improve the accuracy of data used to collect and verify oil royalties, that there really hasn't been changed or updated. And I have put in a bill, H.R. 1462, and this bill would require a National Academy of Engineering study regarding improving the accuracy of collection of royalties on production of oil. And literally, the first panel testified that they need better indicators. Uh, and I feel personally that this would be a, an important step forward. I, I would like uh, to make sure that all of the panelists have a copy of the bill. And if you would get back in writing whether or not you support it, it might be a way to move this legislation forward so that we actually can increase uh, the royalties from um, these publicly owned lands. And, and exactly what will the reorganization do to help improve the accuracy of this data? Is there anything that will improve the accuracy of the data that is taking place now? The reorganization itself uh, it, it says nothing about that. It, w there are many, many things that need to happen in order to improve the, the accuracy of the data, including um, rationalizing uh, databases across the many units of, of the oil and gas management program so that, so that they're actually compatible, fixing um, the functionality of these databases so that they're collecting the data they need to do audits and, and, and uh, oversight. And all of this needs to be done in, uh, with some sort of central vision of bringing the IT system up to date because it's horribly behind what, what uh, the industry uses. Well, I, it's, well, why in the world aren't we updating it? And uh, I would invite all panelists to submit in writing ways that we can update it. Another important GAO report said that there are no audits of the oil and gas company royalty numbers, that the audits are done by the companies themselves. And in so many cases, uh, M MMS is probably under collecting by uh, hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, can you comment on the lack of audits of the oil and gas company royalty program? We found that, that there were problems with the, the self-reporting of data and, and the fact that there weren't automatic and very quick checks of that or, th or the use of third-party uh, data as, as one would expect in a system like this. For example, uh, the IRS, you voluntarily provide your, your tax return, but your employer sends in information and your bank sends in information and the IRS looks at that and compares them. In the case of royalties, th often there is an absence of third-party uh, verification. Now what the industry does is they use uh, metering technology that, that reports every one second on volumes and, and um, the, the, they look at each other's data when there's a dispute between a pipeline company, say, and an, and an oil producer. They look at each other's data and they 
resolve it based on, on, on data. However, Interior has not adopted the kinds of technology it would need to collect those sorts of data, and they could. They could collect it directly from, uh, from lessees. Mr. Chairman, uh, we need to look at that. We need to move into the 21st century, and we need to uh, protect the taxpayers uh, in this area. Uh, I find it uh, scandalous that we haven't uh, moved to modernize, to have audits, to have third-party uh, verification, and that we haven't updated this law since 1920. I agree with the gentlewoman from, uh, from New York, the gentlelady from New York, and of course her time has expired. I now yield uh, one minute to the ranking member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And very quickly, in closing, uh, and we, uh, for Ms. Maloney, we did publish last October something on this with the GAO's help on, on this absence of audit. But, Ms. Kendall, uh, you were mentioning the two cozy and, and the, the various rules related to uh, these friends. But in the case of Colorado, where, you know, look, these people didn't know each other before they got there, but they got to know each other so well that one of the women ended up pregnant. Uh, <laughs> They, uh, they very clearly exchanged gifts at a very high level with people that were not their friends, completely in violation, and then felt that they needed even more leniency. To, to a great extent, isn't this really simply an organization who justifies that somehow, because they do the revolving door, they're all friends and therefore they have a special relationship? Isn't that a culture that has to be changed, period? Oh, absolutely. Okay, I think, I think we've made our point on that. I, I will mention uh, that Mr. Waxman, when he was chairman, held a, an interesting hearing, and that was the analysis of the difference between fuel at temperature and wanting to hold our retailers accountable for the differences in the temperature of the fuel being delivered to the retail pump, because on a 90-degree day versus a 60-degree day, the amount of fuel you get, it exp the BTUs available expand or contract. And the amazing thing was that the technology does exist to do this sort of comparison to, to ensure that the density uh, that you buy equals the density that you agreed to pay for uh, of BTUs. So I would suggest strongly that if we get an organization that cares about the American people getting the revenue they deserve, uh, getting the safety they deserve, we will get there. And I'd like to close by, Ms. Bryan, I, I appreciate your wanting to have the transparency. and. Uh, Mrs. Randolph, but for the GAO and the IG, I want to personally thank you for time and time and time again doing the studies, uh, doing the reports, pointing out these failures, and staying with it even when administration after administration, at least three that I've been around for, failed to do what you asked them to do. And I'm glad to see that we're all united getting it done today. But I want to thank you for sticking with it. Uh, probably if there's anyone whose pay this should be increased, perhaps it should be the people who did their job during this period of time rather than those who didn't. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, let me thank all the witnesses for their time. It's not every hearing where the witnesses and the members on both sides of the aisle agree on the issues. But I think this is one of those rare days in the United States House of Representatives, uh, of course, where federal oversight of shore, off, offshore oil drilling has for decades been inadequate and ineffective. The agency formerly known as MMS suffered from an institutional conflict of interest and repeated regulatory and ethical failures, as my colleague from uh, California just described some of the things that went on. All that has got to change. The recipe for reform is not complicated at all. Offshore oil drilling can no longer be regulated on the honor system. That's number one. There must be rigorous federal oversight and effective enforcement. Conflict of interest must be eliminated. The royalty collections must be separated from regulation and enforcement. Sham environmental reviews cannot be tolerated any longer. I don't want to seem environmentally mental assessments that talk about protecting, you know, uh, but the point is uh, uh, we have to make certain that from this point on that we do that. All spill response plans must be realistic, and we must understand that. The entire world now knows 
that we were not prepared for the BP oil spill. There must be an effective and proven technology available to prevent blowouts in deep water before we allow deep water drilling to resume. I want to thank you again for your testimony. You have been extremely helpful. And let me just say to the Department of Interior, we want to help them in terms of their reorganizing the department. And I think that sessions like this, where we can extract information from people that who have worked on these issues for so long, I think it would be very, very helpful to the department. So thanks again for your uh, input. I want to thank the members who attended, of course, uh, today. And again, on that note, uh, the hearing now adjourns. Here at C-SPAN, we recently made the switch to high-definition TV. On Washington Journal, we talked to John Higginbotham with the Franklin Plant Board, the first cable system to carry C-SPAN in HD.